Hi, welcome to Vortex Algebra, video number six. In this video, we're going to discuss the Vortex Algebra operators, rules, and identities. This video will also serve as the instructions for the software, which will be released next weekend. And we'll explain why they're being delayed again, because we have an, another epiphany, epiphany that I think finally puts Vortex Algebra over the top. And that's going to be in here as well. So what we're going to do is demonstrate the basic operations identities and no, just to note that these operators and identities I'm showing in this video are dependent upon the selection of the sign convention. Remember we showed that in the previous epiphany video. That just If we decide that there's a, a better set, a better rule set out there, that's going to change only the signs and that'll, that'll re uh, either replace or update some of the identities shown here. So again, these are for the particular rule set that we have selected so far. And this video will also describe the C-sharp software, which will be released next weekend. Very helpful. Come on, over here. Over here. Come on, move your big butt. Thank you. Okay, so there's two basic types of types. What I mean by types is like uh, uh, variable types. And you have odd products, and I'll explain what that means that are vectors, and even products, which are matrices. Okay, basically what it means, if you, the number of vectors you multiply together, if you have one vector, that's an even product, or an odd product, so that would be a vector. You multiply two vectors together, that's an even product, that becomes a matrix. You multiply a third vector, well, the result of this is going to be a vector. You multiply a fourth vector, that's going to be a matrix. And you know, the zero product, which is no vector, is a scalar, and scalars exist as matrices only. Okay, so now down here in the software, what you would do is you would create a type, and the type for a vector is Vortex Vector 3D Double Precision, and A is equal to, uh, this is a frommer. This is a way to, this is kind of like in the old C++, this is kind of like a constructor, but what it does, it allows you, it, it's a static thing that just allows you to, to make a vector. Now what we're going to, what what we're going to do here is we're not going to show you the 3D stuff. We're going to show you the 2D stuff, but the software, we use the, the 3D for both the 2D and the 3D. All you do is just put in X and Y, and the software will just process the X and Y dimensions, and it works. It works, you know, so that the X and Y dimensions work independently as a 2D space, and they work properly, and you can also put in the, the other dimensions for the 3D space. Okay, and so for example, we can create vector A with this and create vector B with this. And then we create a vortex matrix three dimension double precision AB as a container to hold the multiplication. This is the double product times a scalar, and that goes into an AB matrix. And then you can just go, you know, this, uh, let's do it this way. This would be, it should look like this. A star B star C. That's what that should be there. Oh, and this should be some other variable. Let's say Q. So it's not the same. Oh, well, that could be a C, I suppose. So you'd, you'd do just A, B, C would go right into the variable Q. And because this is a triple product, it should end up as a vector. Okay, so you get the basic idea. This is the basic operations. The things that haven't changed since for like since legacy vector algebra is addition for both matrix and vectors are the same. Subtraction for matrix and vectors are the same. Multiplication of matrix is still the same. Division of matrix, um, I'm not sure if, I'm pretty sure we're the same. I haven't double checked that, but I'm pretty sure it's the same. Multiplying by scalar for matrix and vector are the same. And dividing by scalar for matrix and vector are the same. Although, in reality, when you use a scalar, it's really a matrix, so it's really a matrix divide. So. Okay, so what's the basic meaning of the version 1 matrix? This is actually, be, we're up to version 1.3 matrix. Okay, so what we have here is we have our x dimension, our y dimension, and then we have vector a and b and c. So what we have here is we have, we're multiplying a times b, which forms a matrix, 
That's why we have the brackets here, it's because once we're a matrix, we, have, we can use matrix operators instead of vector operators. Okay, then what we're doing is we're taking that matrix and multiplying it by C to arrive at our destination, excuse me, D. And so basically the way you read this is the, 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 the magnitude of D is just going to be the magnet, multipl multiplication of all the magnitudes of the vector. So the, the, the resultant D vector is going to, magnitude is going to be A, B, C, the, magnet, the multiplication of the magnitudes of A, B, and C. So we got the magnitude set, set away. The position of D is going to be, and this is the way you read it, this is the easy way to read it. You're going to say I'm going to apply a rotation from A to B and apply that rotation to get from C to D. So if we take the angle from A to B and we take that angle and add that angle to, D, to C, that's the angle where D is going to end up at. So we're rotating from A to B, the variable C, to arrive at D. So this rotation angle is going to be the same as this rotation angle. Okay, so base, and then we're going to be scaling it by, and so, you know, and then also we're scaling it, just, you know, blah. Okay, and so in, in, in the software, what you would do is create a, you know, a vector container, because you're going to do a triple product, and there should be a little star here. And once you create your vectors A, B, and C, you multiply A times B, put them in parentheses, because order of operation matters. Okay, this is different than geometric algebra or complex numbers. Order of operation, in, in those other things, you could do this. Yeah. And we get the same answer. Okay, that's ambiguous. In Vortex Algebra, your order of operation is critical. They've got to be, if you want to get this particular outcome, they've got to be multiplied in the correct order. Okay, what's the, one of the matrix proper, one of the reasons that we're going to start going to matrix properties is because, like I said, there might be another solution out there, and ultimately we're going to come up with these solutions of what the property, the proper properties of the matrix should be. One of the matrices, it must be a matrix, the multiplication A, B must be a matrix. That's one thing it has to be. And the other thing that I've noticed is because the final magnitude of D is going to be the magnitudes of A and B times C, well, if you have your A, B matrix here, Let's say your C vector is only a 1 in the x dimension. Well, that means the magnitude of your, your A and B, it's, in other words, it's got to come out no matter where the energy from, a, from C is. If C is here or if C is just a vector in the y direction, you still have to come up with A, B, C. So if the magnitude of C is 1, it doesn't matter if, if the energy is only in the x dimension or the, the magnitudes in the y dimension or it's distributed between the two, ultimately you have to come out and multiply it by the magnitude of AB, which means that no matter which, each column must have the same magnitude. In other words, 1 squared plus 3 squared square root is going to be the magnitude of AB. and have, We have to get the same magnitude when we do this column. And likewise, when we do the rows, so it doesn't matter which column or which row you pick, you've got to have the same magnitude. Okay, that is something that's very important, and that's becoming one of our properties of matrices. And the reason why we're collecting these properties is if we find out that the, per the particular rule set we're using is not the right one, we want to come up with a set of properties a matrix must have in order to be a proper vortex matrix so that when we do a computer search of all the remaining uh, um, sign conventions, we can eliminate those that don't fit the things we know we need to have. Okay, so we're going to start collecting all these. What are the properties of the matrix? And, one, and again, our first one is the row and column magnitudes must always equal AB. Okay, the signs can be, you know, but the magnitudes, regardless of which you row or column you take, they all have to come out, the magnitudes have to come out the same. Okay, now before we demonstrated right multiply, but what if we decide, well, we're going to multiply C from the left? Yes! If the order of operation, if AB is not the same thing as BA, that means multiplying from the right or the left matters, and that's 
That's what matters here. It matters in vortex algebra. And if you actually do the, the, the multiplication from the left and you go through the rule set using the rule set just the way we did before, but just do it you know, the other way, you do end up with a different solution. You still end up with the magnitude of the result is ABC. Except now, instead of what we did before, is that the rotation from A to B is applied from C to get to D, you basically just run it the other way. It's the rotation from A to B is applied to C to get to D. And So basically it just inverts the sign of the direction, but the magnitude stays the same. So let's do that over here. The rotation from A, from B to A now, that angle is applied to C to get to D. So the magnitude comes out the same, but the, 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 the direction of which the rotation applied is flipped. And this comes up to an interesting identity. So if we took CAB, if we multiplied by C on the other side and then flip the inside of the bit. So we do a double transpose. This ends up becoming an identity. These are the same thing. And in vortex algebra, you would just, to do, do a left multiply, you would just do your A times B and then just multiply C from the left. It'll know to take care of that in the software, I'm saying. But what about right divide? So now we have right divide. So if we take vector A and divide by vector B, well, what does that mean? Well, that also creates an AB matrix, and the magnitude of the result of, of the matrix, and remember, this is the magnitude of any row or column, is going to equal the magnitude of A divided by the magnitude of B. And again, we could multiply this from the right with C, or multiply it from the left from C, or another vector. And the angle is going to be, it should be from B to A, that's right, A to B, okay. And so, so this would be the equivalent down here. If, if you could change the, replace the divide with an equivalent multiply, this would be the equivalent multiply. So basically, the A divided, right divided by B is B times A divided by B squared. And in the software, all you need to do is just divide, use a straight divide operator, and make sure you have a matrix here to, for the results to go into. Then there's also a vector left divide. Okay, and this is the equivalent multiply for a left divide. This is B left divide by A, and that can be replaced. And so, if you kind of notice here, it almost looks like there's a mistake. Because one's divided from the left, one's divided from the right, and yet it almost looks like the same multiply, except the denominator is different. Well, we'll show you the reason why this is in a second because what we have here is what's known as equivalence. What I found out for this particular rule set, a right divide can be replaced with a left multiply, and then all you have to do is compensate the magnitude. And over here, a left divide is replaced with a right multiply, and then you have to compensate for the magnitude. And these become equivalents. And the reason why this is cool it's because when I wrote the software, all I had to do was really write a multiply and then use, when this comes up in the operator, it's just go and switch things around so I can use the same multiply operator for all of the particular operators you'll be using. And those of you who get a chance to look at the software, if you go look, you'll see that the vector multiply, AB or whatever, is used to implement all the other operators with a scalar divide. But then there's, there's not only is there equivalence, there's reciprocals. Okay, here we're replacing an equivalent. Say, so in other words, we're replacing a left divide, I'm sorry, right divide with left multiply. But the reciprocals, okay, if I right divide A by B, then I can invert that by right multiplying this by B. That gets back to A. If I left divide B by A, well, then if I left multiply by A, that inverts and returns us to B. And if I have A times B, which is right multiply, then if I apply a right divide, that inverts the A, uh, inverts and gets us back to A. And likewise, if I have left multiply by B, if 
I div left divide by A, that eliminates that A and gets us back to B. And in, in the, the software, the left, multiple, the left divide is taken care of. I use the modulus symbol in the software. That's left divide. Okay, left multiply is not a problem. All you have to do is have the operator on the left of the matrix. And so the left multiply is known, but they don't have a left uh, multiply symbol. So I had to re take use the modulus symbol for a left multiply. So our multi I'm sorry, for a left divide. Our left mul our multiply can be used on the right or the left, but our other divide symbol like this, that can only be done on the right, and therefore I needed one for a divide on the left, and that's why I use that symbol. Okay, so the multiply can be used left or right, but this divide can only be done on the right, and this divide is done for the left. Okay, I hope it's a little confusing, but it, it makes life easier, um, makes things easier to read. Now, taking a matrix to a power. If I take the AB matrix and I raise it to a number, well, that the simple, the magnitude of the matrix is just the magnitude of A times B raised to the nth. And the rotation applied by AB is B minus A times N. Very similar to what complex numbers do. Okay, now, this function is not implemented in the software yet. It says, if one of you guys want to try to get it in there, that's great. Um, for now, though, if you just have simple even powers, like if you want to take AB squared, well, then just take AB times AB. Or if you want to do AB to the minus 2, just take 1 divided by AB divided by AB. And you can, you can get the simple ones out just by doing a little bit of extra de uh, legwork there. And there's an interesting identity for the reciprocal matrix, AB to the minus 1. This can be replaced with, um, again, trying to replace everything, all, all the crazy stuff with just a plain old multiply. Excuse me. Uh, so AB can be replaced with BA, and then you compensate by the amplitudes. And so the way, the way you can look at this is from the thing I showed before, is this is, this is basically in the denominator. So this is like a left divide, can be replaced with a right multiply. This is a right divide, uh, replaced with a left multiply and then we compensate the amplitudes. And in the, in, in the software, you just simply have to take 1 over AB, and you can get this guy. OK, matrix subcomponents. Here's part where the epiphany came in today. Um, the, matrices, the matrices can be separated into their cross and dot components. OK? They're, they're, there is a specific cross product if you'd like to do that, and a specific dot product. These are being deprecated for a reason that I'll show you later. It's better just to take the a, b, multiply, and then this little function here will just return from this multiply just the cross components. And this uh, a, b, and you put a little dot symbol there, that'll return the dot components. So this will get you this. This will get you this. Now there's an interesting thing. If you swap B and A, it doesn't change the sign of the dot product, but it does change the sign of the cross product. That's important. We're going to use that for identities coming up. So here's, well, here, right here, right now. Okay. So these are what I just showed you. That if you swap B, A, all it does is affect the sign of the cross product. It doesn't, it doesn't affect the dot product. And therefore, if you have a situation where you have something that results in AB plus BA, well, that's pretty cool because the cross products will cancel and leave you with two times the dot product. And likewise, if you have AB minus BA, well, then the dot products will cancel and you get left with twice the cross product. And I'll show you in a second where this is in our application for our committee's no, sorry, hey, um, what do you call this? Pythagorean theorem. The simplest proof of Pythagorean theorem on the planet. So if you take three vectors, here's your three vectors, A, B, and C. A and B are orthogonal to each other, which means they're just perpendicular here. And they form a right triangle where the hypotenuse is C. And we say, OK, in vectors, we know if you add A and B, that's going to give you the same endpoint as C. And so we're going to write that. That's true. That's given. 
You add vectors A and B, and that gives you the vector C. So what we're going to do is we're going to square both sides. Squaring turns this into a scalar. Okay, and if we multiply these out, we're going to have A squared plus B squared. Now, we're not going to get 2AB, which is what you're taught in high school. Because remember now, order of operation matters. You're going to get A times B plus B times A. Now, I go back to our identity here, and we have A plus B times B times A is twice the dot product AB, so we put that here. Now one thing we know about dot products, dot product of two orthogonal vectors are zero. So this cancels and goes to zero. And this leaves the proof for Pythagorean theorem. But it also gives us an answer if this is not orthogonal. With this now you can solve the hypotenuse of, you know, it works. You get the answer for even it doesn't have to be a right triangle. We got, we got a more general solution now. Hot damn. Now, let's go back and use complex numbers to do this. Okay, same thing. We're going to use the, the complex version of vortex algebra. This would be kind of what they did for geometric algebra. Only we're using, instead of, we're not using geometric algebra, we're, we're using the vortex solution to complex numbers here. And in the vortex solution to complex numbers, it does not come out that AB is different. AB is equal to BA in this particular rule set because that's the way complex numbers are. It doesn't matter which order you multiply. It doesn't matter. Okay, and this, this makes all the difference in the world. Let's show this. So then we do this and we multiply this. Now, we're going to get 2AB now because this doesn't matter. So we can just do, this is what you get when you did this in normal everyday high school or when you learn this, or I guess they're teaching this in college, not in high school anymore. Okay, now let's just for the sake of shits and giggles, substitute, make A right along the x-axis and B will make that along the imaginary axis. Just make a simple unit vector and then we plug these in, in, into the equation. Well, because B is in the imaginary, since we square it, that's going to come out negative. And then because they're both unit vectors, it's going to be negative and real. These are going to cancel and you're going to be left only with the 2AB, which is really interesting because it comes out with the right magnitude, which is 2. The problem is it's imaginary. So we have an imaginary scalar. Go figure. So this is not a satisfactory answer, but it gets even better. Because if you were to just copy in this result here and say, well, okay, we're going to replace i with what it is, square root of negative 1. This is not the vortex i, this is the complex number i, which is square root of negative 1. Okay, and then we decide to take the square root of both sides. Well, we have the magnitude c is equal to the square root of 2. That's right. But now we have the square root of the square root of negative 1. Okay, my friends, this is the paradox of the ages, and it's showing that vortex algebra is a much more satisfying solution than complex numbers are. And this is one thing that's, that, one of the things I've been kind of having hawing with over a couple of weeks, kind of slowing me down, is like I'm wondering if we shouldn't have gone more toward a complex number thing like geometric algebra. But when this came up, I'm like, nah, we're going the right way. Vortex algebra is at least on the right, it's at least, at least maybe it's not the final answer yet, but it's at least a better answer than complex numbers. And so, you know, it, that's why from isomorphism with complex numbers is not desirable. In fact, superseding complex numbers with 2D vortex algebra is a goal, but that's for later, not now. So, let's, now we have more matrix properties we can add. So, in case we have to go find that other elusive vortex uh, rule set, okay, we already have one. Okay, and the other one is a matrix transpose should be the same as matrix conjugate. Okay, in other words, if I do a matrix transpose, which in this little 2D matrix swaps these guys, all that ends up doing is negating the signs of the off-diagonal components. And that's what we've been calling co matrix conjugate. And I've come to the conclusion now that this is the way it should be, that matrix transpose should be the same as matrix conjugate for the correct vortex algebra solution. Okay, and transposing AB should transpose the matrix. Now, if I transpose AB, then these get transposed. Okay, in the paper I kind of shied away from that, but I'm getting to the point where I think that is now proper. Okay, so if we have to go searching, we can tell the computer, you know, you can try your one million different, there was 16 million, or I forget, maybe I forget how many millions there were. And as you go through them, weed out the ones where this doesn't end up being true. And that's the reason why we're building this matrix. These are kind of like our rules of acquisition for finding the matrix. And we're going to have some more as we go on. 
This is in case the rule set we have now isn't the right one. Okay, now we had a trigonometric epiphany today. Okay, in the paper, okay, we have the sine and cosine, and I was never very happy with it. It just seemed too kludgy. And basically what we have is you have vectors B and A, and if I take the cross product of AB, okay, and divide by A squared as a scalar multiplied by A, you end up with this guy here, which looks just like the sine. The sine, it would be like, it, like in, in legacy vector, in legacy, if this your angle, it would be the same thing as B sine theta. Except, except, except that it's really going to have this direction in space. So instead of legacy trigonometry, okay, this would just give you a magnitude. This actually has this direction and magnitude. So we're one step better than legacy trigonometry. But the problem is so damn kludgy. And we already know from legacy that the cross product has had an association with sine. We've known that. Okay, but before it was just, again, it would just be, it would just be like a trigonometric magnet. It didn't really have direction. Well, in legacy, it would actually be normal to all of this. It wouldn't actually be in the right place. And then if we did the dot product, same thing, we end up with a cosine. And this guy here is kind of like B cosine theta. And the problem was I didn't quite like this. It was too kludgy and and, and I was just kind of like, ah, and I could, in the software you can see when I release the software I'm going to keep the legacy stuff I had in there and you'll see how kludgy it was. But anyway, I was thinking about this and I said, you know, it's interesting that if I add E and C together, I get B. Hmm. So B is equal to C plus E, right? And if I put these guys in there, these kludgematic things in there, I get this, and then I go, oh, wow, okay, because we know that the, the sum of the cross and dot product is our AB matrix. Okay, that's cool. And then it dawned on me what this is. This is our, 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 our what do you call it, our, one of our identities for replacing divide with a multiply. And I'm like, ah, okay, this makes more sense. Sorry, this got a little busy. So, what we can do now, instead of saying this, we can replace this with B divided by A. And then we can say, ah, here we go. That means when we take the A off, okay, B divided by A, this matrix is the cosine of B over A plus the sine of B over A. And the reason why we want to write it like this is because this is the way we write tangent. And that makes everything symmetrical, everything fits, dovetails really, really nice. I'm really happy with this. Uh, and because of this, I'm ready we're ready to go forward ready to put vortex algebra into the pilot seat and let's see where it's going to take us i'm happy with this now this is this is one of these things that have been bugging me and it's been like distracting me and uh, i've been sitting here just wasting time thinking about this but now this is good this this is symmetric symmetrical so getting back up to the top here so we're going to find here is a new operator okay instead of the because one of the things about these, these guys are the cross product of a multiply. This is the dot product of a multiply. These are of a multiply. But we need the equivalence now for a divide. So what I'm going to do is just make this new operator, which is, which is a divide and a dot product, a dot symbol. So this is going to be your divide dot product. This is going to be your divide cross product. And the way you're going to do that with the software is you're just going to take b divided by a and, and put parentheses around and then just call the dot function. Okay, and the dot function will be used both for the, for the product and the divide. And all the dot function is going to do is give you the, the, the diagonal axis. It's going to give you a new matrix now that only has the diagonal matrix of this result. So whether you have a multiply or divide in here, this dot is going to be used for both the multiply and divide. Same with here, same with the, the, with the sign. That's how you're going to do it. And again, this is the what we did before. This was was what we said were the, you know, the multiply equivalents. So in the software, again, you can actually do b divided by a and just take the dot, and that'll give you the cosine. Or you can take b divided by a, take the dot cross, that'll give you the sine. And you can for tangent, okay, tangent, you can take a. Remember, these are now not the other. This isn't, isn't b cross a. Okay, these can be swapped around to the, to the other way here. So remember, these are opposite directions. 
That's just the way that identities come out. Because if you divide, okay, sine divided by cosine, it's going to be cross product over dot product. Okay, so remember, everything over here is BA. These are AB. Because remember, we're, we're replacing a divide. And when you replace a divide, you end up swapping it. The order swaps to go to the numerator to be a multiply. Okay, remember that. Okay, and so that's why the tangent. So instead of doing that, you can do these if you want. Or you can just call these functions here. If you go look them up in the software, you'll see all these guys do is do those. And the, the nice thing about that is you have one type of calling and don't have to remember the difference between, oh, I got to do a dot here, I got to do a cross here, I got to do a division here, yeah, yeah, yeah. All you have to do is just do these with the same interface. And this is nice because tangent for legacy trigonometry is always the, you know, the B over A. Is it? Or is it opposite over adjacent? I don't remember. Anyway. Anyway, that's the way we're doing it now. So it's the same format for all the trigonometric functions. So what do the trigonometric functions do? Well, unlike the legacy stuff, the legacy stuff was always related to the hypotenuse. The new trig functions are related to the adjacent. Okay, so to get the vector C here, if you take the sine of B over A and multiply by A, you get this vector C here. If you multiply A from the other side, it just inverts the direction. Okay, if you want the cosine, it's cosine of B A times A gives you E here. Now, if you put A on the other side, it doesn't matter because this is a dot product. You know, it, this is, it, this, swapping this won't, won't change the sign. It'll still be the same. Okay, for F, if you want the tangent, you take tangent of B over A times A, it gives you this guy, which comes up and interfaces, you know, up here. And then, of course, if you want to get to B, you take the sine B A cosine B A times A, and that's the way to go from A to B. Now, instead of you want to see the differences, if I replace all these guys with Bs, you can do that too. All it does is rotates all this stuff from A to B, and your, your G over here, okay, G is going to be the ratio of B to A times B. Okay, this guy B here was equal to ratio of B over A times A, which is obviously B. But when you put B in there, you end up with another vector over here that's going to be B over A times B, which is equal to the magnitude of G. Okay, and its angle, the angle is going to be, whatever this angle is, that's what this angle is going to be. And because, so this is, you know, this is, A is bigger than B, and the ratio that B is smaller to A is how much smaller G is going to be to B. If B were bigger than A, G would be bigger than B. I know it's kind of confusing. And I'm going to let you guys read through this on your own, but it basically it gives the same thing. It's just the, the beauty of this is, is all these things apply to the vector you're applying it to. And so you could basically make a pretty interesting spiral function is if you just took you know, your spiral seed where B is smaller than A, and then just kept, then you compute the sine cosine, or you just, no, you just compute the AB matrix, and multiply that by A to get, uh, let's say, D, and the next time just run D for A, and just keep feeding D back into A, and plotting it. And what you'll end up with is a spiral that'll go like this. If you make B bigger than A, you're going to end up with a spiral that's going to go like this. Let's get bigger. So it'd be pretty cool. It'd... So where are we at? I'm very confident now about the 2D Vortrix solution. The 2D stuff works exactly as I expect. I think it works in more, it's more generally applicable than complex numbers or even you know, our buddy there, geometric algebra. The 3D Vortrix solution, which we're going to talk about in the next video next week, has some strange behavior. However, all identities work as expected. It obeys all the matrix properties that we're starting to build. And there could still be another solution out there. But like I said before, the worst it's going to be is a sign change to what we have now. So basically what we're going to do is we're just going to, we're going to drive on. We're going to use Vortex Algebra as we have it now. I'm happy, satisfied with it, and we're going to use it until it doesn't work anymore. 
Now, we're going to get into the software a little bit. Okay, in the software, there is one file called vvortrix3d.cs or for C sharp. This contains the three dimensional double precision structures for the vector and the matrix. Okay, if you're just going to, if you just want to do 2D stuff, uh, whatever you do, just set V and Z, which are the higher dimensions, just set those to zero. The 3D using only the first two dimensions work just like the 2D. It's the same, it's the same solution. Okay, just it does weird stuff in 3D, no problem. Now, the matrix, just so you know, when you're, if you're looking at the code, only stores one column of the matrix. And I'll show you what, which column that is in a minute. So when multiplying these matrices together, the software synthesizes the full matrix multiply, but it only retains the first column. So if you're going to intermingle this with standard matrices, you're going to have to write an interop. Uh, I actually might have one there, I don't remember. Okay. Although there's a, also in the code, there's a row column operator, at line 321, which will allow you to read out the terms of the vortex matrix as if it were a full matrix. In other words, it'll go in there and pull, and from the, it'll synthesize all the full matrix for you from the first column. And when using the two string, it'll only print the first column as a comma separated list of values. Even though it's printed as a row, it printed as a row space, but it's actually the first column. So when you when you run the software, you're going to get GUI. There's nothing under the file uh, menu right now, and of this test of the menus, we're only going to work, talk about the ones that actually do anything. Uh, this little plus sign doesn't do anything. Reconcile. If you click reconcile, what reconcile will do? Reconcile is the software in there um, that. Oh, and, and if you select the 3D, three-dimensional matrix, uh, only three works right now. You can try four, but four does a lot of, it goes, it has weird stuff going on. Three works. Okay, so this sets the dimension of, of the matrix, of the, 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 you know, and this shows you the dimensions, X, Y, Z, and volume, and your volume is V, X, Y, Z. And this goes through, and this will allow you to look and see how we reconcile which dimensions everything goes out to. This is just like I showed you in the previous video, how to reconcile which dimension things go to. This just does it for 3D. Okay, so that you can look at that on your own. If you see something that's strange, give me a holler. Then if you go to the next, which is identities. These identities, don't worry about this overall fail. That was put in there because I was going to make it that only showed the things that passed, but I actually like seeing other things make sure that they fail. For example, over here, this is, I tested out ge ge geometric algebra associativity, and it shows that, you know, in Vortrix algebra, we cannot, we don't have the same associativity they do. We can't just change which order, where the parentheses are. It matters to us. Order of operation matters to us. And so that's appropriate that we should fail that. Okay, and so, these things that pass are supposed to pass. These things that fail are supposed to fail. Okay, and what this does is this goes and takes this equation here, and it makes a hundred random vectors. It, it does it a hundred times each, and and puts creates random vectors for a and b or whatever, whichever a, b, c, d, whatever, and then executes this equation and then checks to see if they're equal or not equal or whatever. And if all hundred pass, it's a pass. If any one of them fail, it's a fail. That's just to eliminate that there might be a, I don't want to try special cases that might actually fail. So once in a while, you might get something that actually passes that should fail. I think I actually bumped this up to 1,000 each to make sure that wouldn't happen. Because you might just end up getting, you know, 100 vectors that happen to be the special case where this guy passes. Okay. The key is, as long as it, there's one condition where it fails, and it's a failure. It's got to pass 100% of the time to be considered a, a, a true identity. Or, you know, you know, you get the idea. So the next one is complex operator study. This was to look at the geometric algebra stuff. And what we do is we're just using this for in two dimensions. And we got a vector, our first vector, which is a unit direction in the x vector. And the next one's a unit direction in the y vector. And then we just do the multiply. And we get the appropriate matrix that we're supposed to get here. And we square them. And we get the negative 1 as a scalar. The little brackets means that that's a matrix. No brackets means that that's a vector. Okay, that's how you tell the difference in the result here. 
And so we square them, we get the, we get the scalar negative 1, which is what we expect. But then what I did, I checked out what geometric algebra did. They just allowed any order of... So I changed all the different ways you can multiply these together. No matter what I did, I get positive 1. And then when I just let C sharp choose the order, I still get positive 1. So you can only do it one way. You can only... It has to be the square of a symmetrical pair. Everything else is gibberish. That's why when they drop the parentheses in the geometric algebra proof, I'm like, these people are complete imbeciles. Anyway... So that was a, just a little study I did with Vortex Algebra to see how, how it would handle all the different orders of operation and to prove out that we do in fact get the um, we do get the right answer when we take the square of a symmetrical product. Then if you go to exponent study, this isn't finished yet but it's interesting. Um, this is a study for solutions of taking the natural logarithm to a vortex matrix. It works pretty nicely. I don't know what it means yet, but it works. So I'm still trying to figure out what it means. Uh, the fact that we can do it is amazing. Okay. So now we go over to the, to the... What's going on here? Oh, okay. And then we have the, going to the M menu here. In the M menu, there's a test matrix. This will test the 3D matrix if that's set to 3. And what it does is it gives you a printout of what the 3D matrix, because the 3D matrix comes out of the 4 by 4 matrix. And then we have these other checks to make sure that there's no sign imbalances. In other words, the dot products in this case have all positive signs, but the cross product has equal numbers of minus, plus and minuses in its positions. This is going to be another one of our checks to see if we have the right matrix. Come on, bud. And the other check that we're, we're going to put in there is that each term should have the same number of terms. It should be four terms. It's a beautiful symmetry. So far, whenever I get even number of terms, I, that's the only way it seems to work. So we're going to put these as more constraints on our matrix properties it should have in case we have to go look for another possible solution. Okay, now if you want to get C sharp code made automatically under the M, if you go and click the C sharp, it'll it'll generate for you a 3D what the 3D matrix should be. So what I did, what the software does as it goes down, it, it looks, it actually takes this guy here, and then looks and says, "Gee, am I the same as this guy except for signs? If that's the case, I'm just going to read this guy back in and do the negative sign, doing all this plethora of multiply." And from this, I realized that, gee, I don't need the rest of this. I only need to store this first four here, and that's the first column. And so that's what the that's the only thing I that's the only part of this I use in the actual software. And then I can just synthesize the rest of the matrix by just using this stuff over here just to put these back in in the right order for the rest of the four by four matrix. And so there's you know there's no sense saving this if that's just the reflection of these guys. Okay, but this software is general enough that if we put another rule set in there, if these do not reduce down, these will be fully fleshed out. Okay, then under the M menu, there's also an Excel feature. In the Excel feature, you can, you can basically tell it, I want to make an Excel spreadsheet application for three dimensions. And so when you click on it, it'll create for you the, 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 uh, the Excel cell equations. And it uses this stuff here. It, don't, it doesn't use the C. The C is for the later menu, which isn't implemented yet, for doing just a plain A, B, C, D, multi, or A, B, C, multiply into D. That's what the C, the, 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 the C is there for. So what this guy here, this tells you that you want your, your vectors. Let's see if I can get this overlay. You're going to start on column C. And vector A is going to be in row 1. So C1 is going to be where vector A is going to be. And then what you're saying is C2 is where vector B is going to be. And then when you click this, it's going to fill this out uh, to give you a 4x4 four four matrix. And so what you're going to do is you're going to pick a column anywhere else, or pick a cell. Oh, and what you have to do to pick up this stuff here is you have to put the mouse here, right-click, Say select all, that'll be highlighted, and then you 
put the mouse here again and you right click and say copy that'll put it on the clipboard then you go over to Excel you pick a cell and you hit paste and it's going to paste out like this for you so the next thing you're going to do before you do anything else make, make sure these four cells are selected is you click go find text to columns and then you open that up and you choose delimited go to next you click on comma and then you'll see the little lines appear which are separating all the columns and then you hit, can hit finish and then what will do is that will put these equations into these cells and then they'll compute from your little vector you have up there and I filled out you know I put all four in there because it's computes for all four but we're only I'm mostly right now playing with the, the two to so do two-dimensional 2D vortex in that case here you just look at these upper four that's your 2D matrix there the rest of the stuff would be the stuff if you're using the 4D matrix or the 3D matrix. Okay, and again, I'm explaining. Um, if you want to do your your stuff, if you really want to do the, the the triple product, you just have to go to the C sharp code and go to line 178. The reason why I don't have this implemented yet because doing the three dimensional or two dimensional multiply is not that hard. But when we get higher dimensions, it's going to be a problem. Now, finally, there, there are other operators defined for the experimental purposes. The comments may not be too detailed on these, but you know, just look at them, see what they mean. There's one thing called a polar product. I'm trying to experiment with other, trying to explore other different properties of the matrices and stuff. Um, the ones I've showed in this video are pretty much um, the ones that are, are valid for now. And I don't know what this is. We already talked about that. We already talked about that. We already talked. Oh, I forgot to. Okay, somehow that concludes this video. Thank you for your patience. I know I meant to have a lot more stuff out sooner, but I've been working very, very, very hard. I've been putting a lot of extra hours in at work to make sure my vacation isn't moved. And so, and the other thing is, this these the things that I was hung up with on Vortex Algebra was also slowing me down. I've Because of these things I displayed tonight, which aren't in the software yet, and they're not in the paper yet, I have to update both the paper and the software. And so next week I'm going to be re-releasing the paper, and I'll be releasing the software to the um, engineer and above, and then letting them look at it for two weeks, and then we'll release it to the, to the lower echelons. Um, Sorry, but you know I have to get. I had to get these things squared away, and I, you know, I've got to make sure that my job doesn't interfere with my vacation plans. So I want to make sure my people at work are happy with my stuff. So when I go away for two weeks, that they're not going to be grumbling. So um, I think we're in good shape. Um, we're looking to uh, the the vacation plan is to start building the the railgun stuff, and um, I don't know if I get it completed in my two week vacation, but I'll try to make uh, videos. Uh, throughout the vacation to let you know the status of, uh, status of what's going on and we're probably going to have our bridge officer chat over a vacation. That's going to start somewhere in two weeks so in two weeks I'll be off for two weeks it's like June 23rd to whatever. Um, next weekend I'm going to put out uh, there's some bridge officers that want to contact me because that's one of the requirements I said I would be put in there. Um, I have to make a video that, that explains there's some, there's some difficult things about contacting me and I'll explain all that in the video. Uh, I meant to have that out a week ago, but again, I wanted to get this Vortex stuff nailed down, which I think we're good at, and I'll put that stuff out next weekend, because next weekend is a catch-up weekend for everything that I missed, so that's what was in the, the uh, schedule. Anyway, thank you for your patience, thank you for the patronage, and I think we're in a good position to move ahead quickly. Now that we've got Vortex Algebra, in my opinion, on a much stronger foundation, I think it, it, we're going to let it tell us now where to go next. Thank you.